Thank you, thank you all for coming. Uh, so I have 15 minutes to say something about zero as well functions. So as the title indicates, I'll try to keep things simple as much as possible. Um, so we'll start with the, the Riemann zeta function, which is the prototypical example of an L function. So if you're not familiar with L functions, uh, for the remainder of the talk, you can think of the zeta function or of more complicated versions of the zeta function in all the uh, statements. So we have this simple looking Dirichlet series and we have an Euler product expression, so product over primes. And uh, studying this function gives you information uh, about the primes. Uh, so this information or a lot of this information is encoded in the zeros of the zeta function, as we're probably all aware. Uh, the zeta function also satisfies a certain functional equation relating the values at s to the values at one minus s. So that will be true for all of the objects that I will uh, be talking about in this talk as well. And uh, okay, so the zeros of the zeta function are encoding uh, arithmetic information. We would like to understand <laughs> the distribution of such zeros. So uh, of course we have the Riemann hypothesis, which uh, tells you what you should expect for the horizontal distribution of the zeros. So they should all be on the critical line meaning real part equals a half. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in the vertical distribution, there's a lot that can be said. Uh, but in particular, we, uh, we expect uh, the following simplicity hypothesis, uh, which says that all the zeros should, should be simple. So there should be no reason for two zeros to coincide. Uh, and therefore, we don't expect them to. So both of those uh, hypotheses are, of course, unproven. Uh, but in analytic number theory, we often try to approximate uh, such statements. Uh, so let me tell you what sorts of things are known uh, for the zeta function. So there's the same as result of Selberg from 42, which says that actually a positive proportion of the zeros are on the critical line. So you can think of this as a strong approximation or maybe a weak approximation of the, the uh, Riemann hypothesis. So uh, a lot of the zeros are on the critical line. Uh, maybe not all of them, but that's already uh, quite interesting. Um, and uh, in fact, this uh, positive proportion was uh, improved by a different method uh, by Levinson in 74. So he proved that more than one third of the zeros are on the critical line. But more interestingly, for the purposes of the stock, uh, as was uh, afterwards noticed by Heath Brown and Selberg, uh, his method actually gives uh, that these zeros are all simple. So he actually produces simple zeros on the critical line. So in particular, a positive proportion of the zeros are also simple, and that gives an approximation of the simplicity hypothesis. Um, so uh, there's an arms race here for increasing these, these proportions. The records for both of them, I think, are around 41%. Uh, it's also worth uh, mentioning that uh, Similar results are available for Dirichlet L functions as well, which you know what those are. So in some sense, at least qualitatively, this takes care of, uh, of uh, the, the case of L functions of degree one. Uh, so we go to degree two. Uh, so here I'm gonna use this notation F uh, throughout the talk for a primitive holomorphic form. Uh, holomorphic is not gonna be too important. Uh, and it's a uh, complete L function will be denoted by lambda f. So um, if you don't know what those are, it's okay. Uh, just think of the L function as something similar to the zeta function, but with, in a certain sense, twice the complexity. Um, so uh, we still have uh, analogs of the Riemann hypothesis and the simplicity hypothesis for, for such L functions. So all the zeros should be in the half line. And essentially, all of the zeros should be simple, uh, unless you have a very good reason for, for a multiple zero coming from the BSD conjecture. Uh, and we would like to prove something towards uh, either of those, or hopefully both of those, those hypotheses. So here you can uh, run Levinson's method, which I'm not going to describe. Uh, but it, it turns out that it works to give a positive proportion of the zeros on the central line. So it does give you. Uh, qualitative approximation for the Riemann hypothesis, but it turns out that it's it's kind of a risky method in that uh, you have to do some numerical optimization in the end, and you might end up with a proportion which is negative, which is what happens if you try to to run it for simple zeros. So it doesn't give you anything. Uh, and uh, and then the question is, uh, what can we say 
uh, about the number of simple zeros for, for the L functions associated to, to such forms. Um, so uh, in that direction, it's only known that a positive proportion of the zeros have order in most three. So that's also using Levinson's method and uh, further ideas, go to farmer. Okay, so um, this seems potentially hard. So uh, let's give ourselves uh, some leeway here. So what can we say conditionally? So uh, I would tell you what conditional means, but first of all, let's establish a little bit of notation. So this will be the last piece of notation for the talk. Uh, the number of simple zeros of our L function with imaginary part in minus T to T will be denoted by this NSF of T. So S for simple, F is for form. Um, so that's the number of simple zeros with height MLC. And we want to understand this function. So we expect essentially all of the zeros, or maybe perhaps all but one of the zeros to be simple. And you can easily compute asymptotically the number of total number of zeros up to high t. So we expect an expression of this form. Um, so what can we say conditionally? So what if we assume uh, the generalized Riemann hypothesis and try to say something about the number of simple zeros? And it turns out that even under GRH, uh, it's not known that a positive proportion of the zeros uh, are simple. Uh, so the best result currently gives this bound of t over an arbitrarily small power of log t, which is still quite far from t log t. By GRH, you mean for uh, Dirichlet functions or to for Holomorphic? Or, 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 or. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So all of the results here will be for holomorphic. Some of them can be generalized to to mass from the loop. Um, okay, so what can we say unconditionally for GL2? So at this point, uh, not much until uh, Corey and Gosh came up with a, a new method for detecting simple zeros. Um, so in the case of the Ramanujan function, which is this function right here, it's a modular form of level one and weight 12, or weight six, depending on how you define weight. Um, they were able to prove that the number of simple zeros is omega of t to the one six minus epsilon. So they were able to, in particular, prove that there are actually many simple zeros in, in this quantitative uh, form. So what is important about this particular function here? Uh, well, the important part is that it, it has level one, which I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what the level is, but you can also think of it as a measure of the complexity of your form. Um, so it's important that it ha has level one, and for the method to work, they they need at least one simple zero to bootstrap it in a certain way, and they just check it computationally for the Ramanujan function. So if you have your favorite modular form of level one, you could also check computationally and get the result. Uh, but up to this point, it was it wasn't known that if I give you a holomorphic form, that there there is at least one simple zero. Of course, you can always check computationally. Uh, so that was the state of things until uh, a breakthrough of Booker from uh, 2012, uh, when he showed that for any holomorphic form of any level, there is at least one simple zero. In fact, he gets infinitely many simple zeros. Uh, so in particular, in the case of level one, there is at least one simple zero. So you can run the argument of Corey and Gosh and get this quantitative bound right here. So for forms of level one, you get omega of probably t to the one six simple zeros. Um, new form always, yes. Um, and uh, so uh, I recently improved uh, this result to uh, omega of t to the one fifth uh, in the case of level one. Uh, so we have reasonable quantitative results if the level is one. Um, and so uh, the question becomes, what if the level is non-trivial? Can we also mimic these sorts of quantitative results? So here is Booker's result again from the previous slide. It shows that there are infinitely many simple zeros regardless of the level. And it turns out that if you try to make this result quantitative, um, you run into some roadblocks. Um, so the roadblocks of the level are similar to, or 
it's possible to make an analogy with the difficulties in uh, extending the hacky converse theorem, if you know what that what that is, to to general level. So that, that was done by Ve, and uh, the difficulties are slightly reminiscent uh, here in extending this result. Um, However, uh, Booker, Milanovic, and Ng were, were able to obtain a quantitative result. So uh, here's the result. They have to assume that the level is odd because it turns out that twists by one half are very useful in this problem. Um, but in that, at least in that case, they, they get uh, this quantitative bound. So generally, they get omega of triple log of t and uh, something slightly better in uh, particular cases. So uh, as you can see, this bound is of logarithmic quality, right? So what's really behind what's going on here is uh, they need to, uh, in a certain part of the argument, they need to use a, a zero free region for these L functions, right? So this, this explains in particular why the bounds are of different quality because they have different quality zero free regions for, for each of those cases. Um, but this turns out to not give you a power bound uh, or a result comparable to what Karin Gosh gives you, which is quite frustrating because, well, at least naively, the level should not play a role uh, in this problem. Um, so uh, I was able to partially overcome this roadblock. Um, so showing that if, if F uh, has any level, then it is possible to, to get a power bound. Uh, so not quite one sixth or one fifth as in the, the result of Karin Gosh. Uh, but some small uh, exponent, in this case, 2 over 27, it can probably be, uh, can probably be improved. Um, OK, so uh, I want to mention some open problems uh, surrounding. Oh, so I, I should also mention that uh, the techniques uh, behind all of these results, so the method originates with Corinne Gosh and, uh, and uh, the new ideas uh, used by Booker have applications also to, to other interesting problems. So for instance, uh, Booker applies it to generalizations of the, the converse theorems, if you know what those are, and uh, to uh, the arc and conjecture as well. Um, so uh, a similar circle of ideas is, is applied there. Um, so, okay, let me mention uh, some open problems uh, that are maybe not clearly related, but uh, turned out to be related to, to the results that I just mentioned. So uh, something that, in increasing order of difficulty, perhaps something that would be nice would be to obtain uh, the falling six moment bound. So uh, this is an analog of uh, Heath Brown's uh, 12 moment bound for the data function. If you're familiar with that, and uh, it, it should be within reach, it's known for level one due to Utila, and would improve uh, some of the results that I presented. Um, more interestingly, um, along the argument, so that the, the new input for the case of general level is uh, are certain zero density estimates. And along the argument, you need to rule out uh, a situation of this form. So you need to rule out uh, a high degree of vanishing for a bunch of twists, character twists of your form at a fixed point row. And I don't know how to do anything better than uh, using zero density for row here. So I can get this result if the real part of row is at least seven over nine. But it should be nice. It would be nice to actually use the fact that this, this is the same row. Um, so uh, that's something that would also uh, improve the, the, some of the results that I presented. And uh, finally, uh, very little is known for, for GL3 or higher. So essentially, anything non-trivial about the multiplicities of the zeros for GL3 uh, would already be interesting. And uh, the techniques don't seem to be directly applicable. Um, so the only result that I'm aware of for GL3 is a result due to Booker which says that there are infinitely many uh, zeros with odd multiplicity, which is, <laughs> it's something, but yeah. I can actually, I have a minute, so I can actually give you the proof. Uh, you take uh, your L function, let's, let's prove that there is at least one simple, one zero of odd multiplicity. All the zeros have even multiplicity, you take the square root of your L function, and that still looks like an L function. 
but it was degree three, so now it's degree 1.5, and that cannot exist. Right? <laughs> General results about the sober class. And so yeah, it's a, it's a very nice result, but there's very little which is known for GL3. So uh, I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Can one handle that? Also? Uh, yeah, so uh, the result of Booker, uh, so infinitely many simple zeros, this result was generalized by Booker, Cho, and Kim, two mass forms. Uh, those two haven't yet, but there should be no serious obstructions. So uh, I use uh, the Ramalajan conjecture here for simplicity, but it's actually not necessarily. So all of the information that you need about the Fourier coefficients is already coming from, for instance, Rankin Silberg. So it should be possible. It's very strange that you that you have to use full levels of time. So what's the reason? Um, so the reason is that okay, you, you detect these simple zeros through a counter integration argument, and you need to twist so that the main terms don't cancel. Uh, so you encounter a certain additive twists. Uh, and uh, if you have level, you're forced to twist by one over n times uh, whatever you're twisting in the opposite side, and that causes certain complications um, with non-primitive characters and so on. In terms of the failure of the Artin conjecture, which you mentioned, which is what Booker was after, what do your results imply that uh, you know the function's meromorphic by Brouwer. Um, you uh, and if it's either entire, I mean, what he proved in his thesis was that if you had bad guys, you would have to have a tremendous number of bad guys. So are you improving the number of bad zeros? Is that it? So if it fails, it fails. Are you improving the exponents? What are you improving? Yeah. So uh, the results don't directly apply to to the Arkham conjecture case, though. Uh, they might. So another open problem that I didn't that I didn't put here would be to get a, make Booker's result in the Arkham conjecture case quantitative, right? So if you're not automorphic, then you have some quantitative amount of poles. You, you got infinitely many. Um, uh, there may be some difficulties with that, but uh, a priori, some of the ideas would be applicable here. Um, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it should be seen. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> Let's thank Alex.